พิ่มเสียงหน่อยค่ะเสียงเราครับได้แล้วค่ะเชิญครับก็สวัสดีกับทุกท่านนะครับ Hi Good afternoon everyone I am from the p a k i n Yo Karen Folklore from Chiang Mai So this video is actually um, a, a story, and that she she tells about uh, folklore. So this video would show you how the folklores are expressed and how stories are told, and how different uh, um, cultural aspects are also embedded in that. And the community that we selected is from Pama Village, m a s o r i n g The majority of the ethnic tribe is Karen. Um, profession, we are farmers and we're involved in agricultural. And you can see that this is the map of the village. And you can have, you can see that there is the Ban Pama g a o and Ban Pama g a o This is the cultural heritage map. And as I mentioned, each of the places that we have mapped. Are actually the elderly who had told us the stories, and so you have main areas, which is the boat, which is the temple, and so this is the new p a m a k m a i That's a different community and the the, hist the important place at the school, and the strength of the heritage. So we still use a lot of the local community radio, but the challenge is. A lot of people are not really paying attention to it, and not so many people listen to it. And the community still discuss and communicate in their own dialect. So that's the strength, right? So there's the uh, community radio, and then also people still use the dialect, the local dialect. And the risk factors are that a lot of not so many people are, are interested in this. And then also another factor is that they're not documented, and the way in which the stories are told is a uh, vast interest among the new generation. And for the the next point, we want to show how how the community can can partake in this. So the first thing is it can also be a linkage between different generations inside the community. And um, secondly, the local community members can also participate in raising awareness. Of their own cultural heritage, and thirdly, the people preserve the language and the dialect. And we're going to try to divide into three activities. So the first one is for coordination to engage community members. The second activity is to collect data and also to to request information from the local um, wisdom and translation. And the third activity is to share on the knowledge related to the community heritage. So we can divide into three different uh, factors. The first one is those who are the listeners, and the challenge that we find is that a lot of people don't understand the stories and finds it challenging. And the audience prefers to spend time on something else and not from storytelling. For example, social media, education, and sometimes the stories are really long. And the other factor, which is the storyteller, so they don't have time to tell the stories. And the second thing is, they don't remember, they don't recall the numbers and uh, the stories anymore. And the last thing is also they forget, and sometimes the story are uh, missed because they they don't remember all the details. And the third factor, which is the content, sometimes the story is so long and it's so lengthy and it's not interesting, and it it does not relate to the current times. And sometimes uh, stories lack logical cohesion, therefore it's not interesting. And we had identified 15 types of the folklore, and due to time limitations, we just focus on the 15. There are more. So it can be divided into four categories. The first one is about the value and being good, and second um, is about love and loyalty. That's four, uh, four of them, and then there's also entertainment and the role of the stories in the folklore. So in the past, the the folklore used to uh, act as a tool between the storyteller and the listener. So the listener. Usually were um, so it used to be told amongst the adolescents and the youth, right? So it used to be the stories that you know, for example, um, used in courtship, and sometimes the stories also tell to to younger kids. 
and for example, sometimes it's closely related to the farming traditions, sticky rice um, harvest, and then um, there are a lot of linkages to, to the stories which is told during the evening. So after the whole day of rice harvesting, at the, in the evening, they tell stories which are related to that. And also there's a lot of values embedded and in the stories about morals, ethics, and so that they can pass on to the youth and the children. And also on the listener side, they, so the storytelling also needs to make sure it adapts to the current time so that the audience keep, uh, is interested. And of all the 15 stories, we had consulted with the community leaders local philosophers and we had identified several points uh, through partic participating process and everybody came to the consensus that we would come up with a new way of uh, the folklore and storytelling which also reflects to the traditional beliefs so which is about the traditional belief of the Bantama. This is an example. So in the past, there are rotational farming, and we prayed so that there would be fertility and there would be water, and this ritual itself is considered nat nature preservation. But currently, Farming still maintains, but the ceremonies in which we pray and pay respects to the nature disappear. And inside the community, we have the shrine, and we we always pray for respect, and we always pray so that the deities and the gods care for us. And during the rainy season, we also pray to P5 to make sure we have enough waters for the, um, the rest, for, for the farming. And then we also, we also have our spiritual leaders and there's a lot, this is something that has been passed on from the older generations to now. And the projects that we would like to propose with the community members and we can divide the project into three different phases as follows. The first one is to create a platform between the children, youth and children and the elderly. So the storytellers and also the audience so that they can share their knowledge. They can um, perhaps we can conduct an activity at the main sala or at a temple, which is considered a public community space. So we would take about four months doing that. And the second phase of the activity, we would also consolidate different stories, the folklore, we would screen them, we would document them. Perhaps in there, we'd also include things, for example, um, like a storytelling competition, and we can also find different uh, ways in which we can publish them. We can create animations and to write a story or even just create some kind of like a model so that the other communities can see how it can be done. And that is it. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm very proud to be part of this program. First commentator, please, Jitendra, please. Uh, first, yeah, thank you um, for the presentation. Uh, it, it was uh, very wonderful to know that there is such an oral tradition and there are some aspects that are still not fully documented. So it's a great effort uh, to begin with. Um, just getting to the presentation, I found a couple of, um, I struggled to find um, what was going to happen beyond phase three. Um, and I, I, I felt that what the team was trying to do initially was to document uh, largely what is oral tradition, either by recording, um, and thereafter try to bridge or make that knowledge accessible to the younger younger public. Um, I, I mean, my own limited experience, and I do have quite a lot of exposure to the current uh, culture to some extent, is that it's quite phenomenal and quite fantastic. It's also a, a very unique in many ways, and many of the current people I've met are very creative and very talented in music. 
particularly. I have a friend who plays a violin in the current community. Um, what I would like to tell the team and suggest to them is that, yes, knowledge in itself, uh, if you're looking at sustainability is what I think we want to do, um, may not reach the ultimate goal of, of perpetuating it through cultures. You need to try to find a mechanism to make it uh, either relevant or make the communication more relevant. For example, in Japan, a lot of the young illustrations and comic book stories you see are drawn very much from their uh, historical folk tales, from their heritage, and they have made it uh, in a way very, um, the, the illustrations and the characters have been made to fit the modern times. So that perhaps is one way you can make it relevant and exciting and for people to really get to know and understand um, uh, the Karen uh, hugely wonderful heritage culture and, and folklore, which is you know very unique in the context of oral tradition. Um, the other the other comment I like to make generally, and this is a comment that I like to make throughout the symposium. Um, your folk tales are not irrelevant. You talk about love and courtship. You talk about uh, money and politics and all of these aspects that are very relevant today, like Buddhism and teachings of various aspects of Buddhism or even Christianity. So I would like to say to you not to feel that what has been uh, talked to you is irrelevant today. It is a matter of showing the narrative in today's context. And that is a challenge that you have to take up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, uh, Kunvilani from Government Savings Bank, please. Okay, firstly, I have to say that that's challenging. It's, it's difficult for the three of you to work on folk law because it's not normal folk laws. It's also Pakakayo folk law. So I don't know if you are an ethnic tribe, can I ask? Yes, I am part of the community member. Yes, I am. Is it the three of you? Yes, the three of us. Because then if you cannot speak the language, then you cannot transfer the knowledge of the local wisdom into motion graphics, right? So did you do that yourself, this motion graphics? Yes, we did it ourselves. I like that one. And I think that's great. I, I really admire that. That's great. I think it's really great that you can transfer their knowledge into this motion graphics. And, but I, I would like to leave something, for example, if I don't understand your dialect, perhaps you need some kind of subtitle so that people who do not understand can read it. Um, so actually uh, your, your group is like the one that's most promising because I, I really wanted to listen to it because my background, I work a lot with the youth group, youth theater drama groups. So therefore I really had high hopes on this. So I have five main questions. The first one, what is the purpose of your safeguarding these stories? So we think that the documentation, the consolidation, why, what for? Um, so it becomes the model and that the community can be more engaged. They can be more aware so that they understand the importance of their own dialect and language because the newer generation, the youth, they, they don't even understand their own dialect. And, and I think that they don't have, they don't feel so engaged because they don't understand. So, okay, for example, if you wanna do this internally inside your own community, then actually that's the question. So do you need to do the motion graphic? Do you need technologies? That's a question. I mean, I'm not going to comment yet, but I, I think the important thing is what's your what's your goal? So if you want the can your, um, stories to be disseminated outside, then you can use those motion graphics and whatever. But I mean, if you want to do it within your community then to go that far, I'm not going to give you an answer yet, but I want you to think about it. And secondly, um, when we talk about grouping of stories, I think those who are working in stories, they, they need to understand two science. And the first one is storytelling science, yet the other one is uh, acting. So because stories, they are fluid and you can present it through different dimensions and aspects. And for example, um, the Red Riding Hood in each country, they have their own ways of expressing it, yes. And I mean, I sound a little bit uh, like in, academic, but um, 
but I also want to refer to my professors, Parisha and Lecomte and Wendy, who are my teachers, and they say what's more important than grouping these stories, it's to connect to the individuals. For example, you talk with Nina, you can tell Lukiao, that's one version. You can tell Adan Parita, that's also a different version. And if you want to tell the younger kids, that's also a different version. And, and the meaning behind that is in your presentation, it's too wide to, to identify what kind of stories, um, who the audience to your stories are. And, and I think when you need to address the wider audience, how are you going to make that possible? And furthermore, to, to, to think on top of that, I am really personally interested in stories and again, your uh, care in folk laws because I am very into it. And I think what's really nice about it, it's very gentle. So now I'm talking about business. So the first thing is tourism with the backgrounds and the locations of what your folk laws are based on. There's a lot of natural aspects. There is this kind of like a romantic version of you know the lifestyle, the local lifestyle. And actually you can use that to promote the business. And furthermore, besides being children's stories, actually now a lot of the stories that we take and read, they're all Western stories. So not so many people reflect local folk laws. And once there was this organization who does educational promotions activities by this Kunjing Sarabut, and they have she has been trying very hard to promote traditional folk laws. And I think uh, they lost to the Western or even the Japanese, the foreign stories, and they were they were more popular compared to the Thai story. So I think this is something that's really interesting. And I think there are some hopes that you can take these local folk laws forward and, and try to introduce it. And another thing is actually, um, it, it represents sustainability. You have all these mountains, rice, village. So there's a lot of natural linkages, culture, sustainability. You use the story, you know, focusing on the quality of education. And I think you can link that. And I think the governmental policies, especially with OPEC, the basic education um, council, I think that well, they can learn the dialect together on a parallel basis with Thai language. So actually part of the strategy of this current government of Thailand, if you read and you study, you can know that one of the things that they want to set up is like a foundation to, to preserve the dialect. So I'm just, that's just, okay, let's see this as a sharing of my opinions and not comment. But I think also, I think that you need to be more clear. You need to have a better timing line. You need to be more clear about what you want. And I think that it can connect about society, economic, business in every project of today. Thank you so much. So next to Montreal, you can keep it short. Thank you so much. Actually, I agree with all of the former commentators and I wanna share something very quickly. And, and also I might see something in addition to that. So the folk laws is something that makes you understand lifestyles better so but then also another at the same time it's also a tool for entertainment and one of the commentators uh, talks about sitting in modern times so how do you make that resonate to the different generations and this is when the stories can pass on to the current situation and also to the future generation so these kind of morals, these kind of story morals are not written, but it's passed on through the oral traditions. So it also increases um, like the, the wisdom, the morals, and it's the basis of justice even before justice reaches the justice system. So all of these morals that's hidden inside the stories also give you the answer or addresses the issue of justice and some injustice inside the community, also mediation, reconciliation, and peace, right? So I want you to go back to, to when, you, when you think about these folk laws and the stories, and I want you to be proud that actually what you're doing now and 
or the clustering that we are trying to do or the safeguarding of auditories and folk law, don't forget that. It's, it's a good reflection of the morals and the ethics is already a big part of it. And also, I want to um, say something. Actually, you touched upon the oral traditions, which has been passed on from the former generation, but also there's something else to beyond the folk laws, right? So there are some kind of puzzles, for example, food, singing, songwriting. So even the, the little furnitures, the things that are used inside, these are also part of that. So I'm just helping you identify further ways to group it. And today I was listening to something on aging society. And you can see that actually folk laws, I mean, the knowledge of these are always in the elderly, right? It's part of the women who are the elderly inside a community. And they can also say that actually these stories are one of the instruments to maintain the quality of life and dignity of the elderly. So I think therefore, there's also the societal aspect to this and also the mental health aspect to folk laws. And what you're doing now can also touch upon it. That, that is about it. Thank you.